discusses a number of sugis related to the issue of what happens when people are selling the property of Yisomim, of orphans, after the death of their father, in order to pay off obligations of the wife's ksuba or any other obligations. So we have a number of small sugis related to this topic. The Mara's first discussion follows a Mishnah, in which we had discussed the of if the Beisdin sells it and they misvalued it, so unless they were off by a sixth, the sale counts. Even if they were off, they devalued it or they overvalued it, it still counts as long as they were off by less than a sixth. However, we've seen earlier that if the Amana herself, if she devalues it, even if she's off by just one Zuz, the sale's canceled. So the Mara wants to know what happens if there's a Shliach? What happens if there's one person who's a messenger who was made by the Yisong in order to sell their property in order to pay off obligations. Is he like the Beisdin, and therefore he has a leeway of a sex, or is he like the Amana, and he has no leeway at all? Which one is he more similar to? So the Mar says it really depends why there's a difference between the Beisdin and the Amana. Is it because the Beisdin is a Rabbim, it's a group of people working together? In that case, the Shleich would be different. He would be like the Amana. He's not a group of people working together. On the other hand, Maybe the reason why the Almana has no leeway is because she's doing this evaluation for herself. She's selling the property and she's going to take the money for herself. In that case, the Shliach is not like her. The Shliach is like the Beisdin. He's not doing it for himself. So the Umar says it's a machlokas between Rav, between Rava and Rav Shmuel. What did Rav Nachman hold? According to Rav Shmuel, Rav Nachman said that it's like an Almana. According to Rava, Rav Nachman said that the Shliach is like the Beisdin. And the Gemara says the final psak is that the Sheikh is like the Amana, and therefore he has no leeway at all. Now the Gemara says Kash on that. The law is like this, that the Sheikh has no leeway. So how can we find that a Sheikh who was made to, who was given the job of separating Truma for his homeowner, there he does have leeway. So we see in a Mishnah that if somebody geeks, if somebody says to a messenger, go and take off Truma from me from my things, so you should try to figure out how much of Abayis wanted to give, a 40th, a 50th, or a 60th. And if he doesn't know, he should go with the middle. He should go with a 50th. And if he's off, he went a little more or a little bit less. It still works. It's still okay. Now, why should that be still okay if the guy didn't want him to take off so much or didn't want him to take off so little? If it's off and you're telling me that a shliach is like the amana and can't be off by even one zuz, so why over there is it okay? So the answer is the reason that over there it's okay is because it's within range. There are some people who do a 40th. There are some people who do a 60th. It wasn't a mistake. It was just he he evaluated. He assumed his base and his understanding standing of the Mishalach, that that's what he wanted. He didn't make an error. In the case of the Amana, though, and the case of the Shliach, he made an error. He misvalued it. That is not the correct value. There, there's no leeway. Next, the Gemara wants to discuss is the Halacha like the Chachamim, or is the Halacha like the opinion of Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel in our Mishnah. We saw that the Chachamim hold, as we said earlier, that if the Beisdin are off by less than a sixth, the sale still stands. If they're off by a sixth or more, the sale is canceled. Shimon ben Gamliel disagrees, and he says the Beisdin, what they do has to stand. He cannot cancel what the Beisdin will do, because then that undermines, weakens the power of the Beisdin, and people aren't going to take their word for anything anymore. So even if they're off by more than a sixth, Still, the sale, the sale is going to continue and is going to stand. Says the Gemara, who is the halacha like? So Rav Nachman says the halacha is like the chachamim, and that if the sale is off by too much, it's canceled. Says the Gemara, that means to say that Rav Nachman does not hold of the concept of ma kleach bezniyafa, doesn't hold of the concept that we have to support the bezni and make sure that their power is not undermined. But I'll show you elsewhere that Rav Nachman does hold of that concept. You have to make sure that the power is not undermined. Where is that? It's about the topic of what happens if the bezni appoints an apotropos, they appoint a guardian to take care of the interests of Yisom. The case over there is that you have a father who died, left over a bunch of Yisomim, and they are children, so the Beisdin appoints a specific guardian for each one to act to, to uh, advocate for his interests in the division of the property of the fathers. Let's say you have four kids, so you'll have four apotropos and one for each kid, and they're each going to work for the their respective charge to make sure that he gets the best deal that is possible to happen. Now, over there, Rav Nachman quotes Shmuel, and Rav Nachman says his own opinion as to whether the children can grow up, when they do grow up, can they reject the settlement that was made by their apotropis and want to protest against it. So Shmuel had said that they can protest, and Rav Nachman himself, he quoted Shmuel, but then he he himself said they cannot protest because we have to make sure to support the power of the Vezdin. So over here, 
How could he say that we're not worried about the power of the basin? So the says it's not a problem. Here, the basin made a mistake. The basin made a literal mistake. You have to review. You have to reverse their mistake. They undervalue the property over there. There was just a split. They didn't like the split. So uh, to just say we're going to undermine the basin because they didn't like the split, that you can't do. They didn't make a mistake. You can't just undo what they did. So as if they did make a mistake, why are they rejecting it? What is the issue exactly? If they're obviously if they're rejecting it, there's a mistake. Mer says no. The reason they're rejecting it is because they didn't like the piece that they got where it's situated. The, the, the split was even, it was fair, but they had a vested interest in having, let's say, a certain field on the north or on the east. Let's say they had another field that was near that area. So you had a child who acquired a field on uh, that borders the eastern edge of his father's property, then he wants that his piece should come from the east. So he has a reason then to protest. Even though it was a fair split, he wants the eastern end, and he got, let's say, the western end, so that's where he's going to protest. And on that, we say, However, in our case, when they made a mistake, we don't, we're not worried about Now, as far as what the halacha is, the Gemara now quotes two stories about Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. It's actually two versions of the same story of Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. One brought by Rav Dimi, one brought by Rav Safra, and they might well explain why they have different versions. So the story was that Rabbi wanted a paskin that in a case where the calculation that was performed was wrong, that it should be changed. And he was told by Rav Parta, who was the son of Rabbi Lozer ben Parta, who was the grandson of Rabbi Parta Hagadol. He was told that if you do that, then the power of the Bezin will be undermined. We'll have Makach Bezdin Yafe. And therefore, Rabbi changed his psak and did not change the Bezin's ruling, even though it was wrong. Meaning he held like he was told and he accepted the holic of Shimon ben Gamliel, that we don't change the psak of the Bezin. So the Gemara says, according to Rav Dimi, Rabbi actually paskined that the Bezdin should switch, and then he was told, so he reversed himself. And according to the second part, he didn't actually paskin it yet, he was just planning on paskining it, and then Rav Parta told him, but what about Makach Bezdin Now, that was, that's Rav Safra's version. Says, so, what's the Machok is Rav Dimi and Rav Safra? Maybe they're arguing, when a Bezdin makes a mistake in a clear halach in a Mishnah, what we call a Dvar Mishnah, like our case, we are the halach is like Rav Shimon Ben Gambil, who said, Makach Bezdin and he gave a reason, so therefore he cancels the Dvar Mishnah, that that cancels the Dvarim Mishnah. So according to Avdimi, it, it has to be, it could be that he actually paskin and he's reversing himself because when a basin makes a mistake in the Dvarim Mishnah, they could change. And maybe the reason that Rav Safra held that the case had to have been that he was planning on changing the Psaq, but he didn't actually change the Psaq is because he held that you cannot reverse yourself had he already paskin. You cannot reverse yourself on a Tal Bidvar Mishnah, and therefore he had to say that he didn't actually make the ruling. Sigmar says that would be a nice shot, but it doesn't necessarily have to be correct. It could be that Redeem and Rav Safra both agree. Here, as far as what the Allah is in the Tabitha Mishnah, they both agree. Here, they're just arguing what was the actual case that happened. They both agree that you could change a psaq if it's a Tabitha Mishnah. They're just arguing what actually happened over here. Had he given the psaq and changed it, or had he just been planning on giving the psaq and then decided not to give it in the end? It's a simple question of what actually was the story. The Gemara now moves on to another halacha, and that's said by Rav Yosef, that when the Amana or the Bezin sell the property of the Yisomim in order to collect money to pay off their obligations, and it turns out that the person that they sold it to ends up losing the property. It turns out that the field that they sold was stolen, or that it had been mishubit to somebody else who was owed it, and he could take that field away. So the person who bought the field ends up losing his field. So that person has the right to go back to the Yisomim, or the actual owners of the field, even though they didn't sell it. He bought it from the Almana, or he bought it from the Basin. But the owner was the Yisomim. He can go back to the Yisomim and say, listen, you have to replace my field. I bought my field. The money went to you. It went to pay off your obligations, and then I lost it. So, therefore, he has the right to go back to them. So the one says, what's the Chiddush over here? Obviously, it was their field. If it's lost, then he gets to go back to them. So the one says, look, if it would be sold by the Almani, right, there's no Chiddush. There is a Chiddush, though, if it's sold by the Beisden. And that is because it's possible somebody who buys from a Beisden assumes that since purchasing from a Beisden is a well-known thing, it's, it's, it's a famous activity, everybody's aware of it. So maybe he assumes that obviously if I'm buying from the Bezdin and no one comes forward to claim that it's their property or they have a right to the property based on an obligation, based on a monetary chov, 
that there must not be any. And therefore, the person is willing to accept that he's buying it without a guarantee that it'll be replaced because he assumes, in fact, that nobody's come forward, even though it's such a well-known, famous activity, that there is no one else. Therefore, if this comes to tell me that no, there is no such assumption that the person is willing to buy the field without a chayis, without a guarantee. And therefore, if he does end up losing it, he does maintain his right to be replaced, and he has a guarantee, and he can have his field replaced if it gets lost, even though he bought it from the base then. Next, the Gemara wants to know, according to Hashem ben Gamliel, that the sale of the Vezin is not reversed, even if it's off by more than a sixth. How far does this go? How far do we allow the Vezin to be off before we're going to reverse our sale? So the Gemara says up to 50%. That means 50% either way. If the actual value is 50% of the sale value, meaning it was sold for twice as much as it's worth, or the opposite, if the sale value was half as much as the actual value was sold for half as much as it's worth, either of those two cases, that's the limit. That's where we won't allow the basin sale to go through anymore. Okay, next, the Gemara says the concept of achraza, and that is a rule that you have to announce before the basin sells, sells something that this is being sold, allow people to look at it, put in a bid, and that way we get a good idea of what the proper evaluation is. So the Gemara quotes a halacha in the name of Amimar, uh, in the name of Rav Yosef, it's Amimar quoting Rav Yosef, who says that if they sell it, if the Vezin sells it and they don't do this auction process, they don't leave it open for a period of time for people to look at it and to bid on it, then the sale is as if it is voided. It's as if they made a mistake on an open halacha and a mishnah, and it's voided, and they have to do the sale over again. So the Mar says, what do you mean it says if they made a mistake in an open halacha? They did make an, a mistake in an open halacha. There's a mishnah that says, and when you evaluate property of Yisomim, you have to have a 30-day auction period. And if you evaluate hectic property, you have to have a 60-day auction period. So you see, it's a clear mishnah that this is what you have to do. So what do you tell me? It says if they violated a mishnah. Smart says, no, that Mishnah doesn't necessarily refer to a basin. It could have been referring to a shliach. could be the basin doesn't have to do that. And therefore, it's not that they actually violated an open Mishnah. It's true that they have to do that, but it's not an open Mishnah that they have to do that. However, nevertheless, some of are saying that you do have to void it, and it's as if they violated an open Mishnah, the sale is voided, and you have to redo the sale with a proper achraza, with a proper auction period. Now, the Gemara asks the Kasha, and that's from the Baisa, and the Gemara gives three answers. So the Kasha is asked by Ravashi to a Maymar. Brings a Baisa that has two cases. The first case says that if the judges of the court make an evaluation and it's off by a sixth, then it is canceled. Clear implication is that if it's not off by a sixth, if it's an accurate evaluation, it's not canceled. Now, the next case says that if, however, there was an auction, it was a 30-day period of auctioning, allowing people to place a bid and to look at it, then even if it ends up with a, with an evaluation, which is off by more than a sixth, the sale is not canceled. So clearly, the first case, we were saying that if it's off by a sixth, it's not we're saying where if it's off by six, it is canceled. It's talking about where there was no auction. However, it's only if it's off by six that it's canceled. But if it would be done properly, if it would be a proper evaluation that's not off, then it would not be canceled. So you see clearly that even though no evaluation was done, no calling out was done, no auction period was extended, still, unless the valuation ends up being off, the sale goes through and we don't cancel it. That's a contradiction to what you said, that if you don't do the proper achraza, the proper auction period, then it is canceled. So the moral first three answers for this. The first answer is that there's two types of items. There are some items that you don't do a 30-day auction period on. So on land, you could. However, on avadim and on movable objects and on shtaros, contracts, you do not offer them off. And the reason is because they'll end up being lost or destroyed. Avadim, if they find out that they're being sold, may run away. Movable objects and stars will be stolen when people come to look at them. Somebody's going to pocket it and walk off with it. So therefore, when we say that you don't have to do an auction period, it's talking about avadim, metatalin, or stars. Second answer is that there are certain obligations that you don't have an auction period for because they have to be paid right away. Uh, in Naharda, they say to pay the head tax to the king, to pay Mizonos for um, people who need to collect Mizonos, and to do the kavura, the burial for the wife. Those things, you need the money right away. You can't wait, and therefore you don't do a 30-day achraza period to take that money from the Yisomim.
Now, the third answer is that there are different minhagim, different places there are. Some are places where they do hachraza, and some places they do not do hachraza. Like Rav Nachman said, they never do this whole Igeris because they never do this whole hachraza period in Naharda. Some people thought that that is a compliment to the Nahardians because everybody knows the evaluation so well that they don't have to do the public evaluation. Rav Yosef Bar Menumi said, however, it was explained to me that it's not what Rav Nachman meant. Rav Nachman meant that they will take advantage of the situation and they'll all bid low and keep the price down and end up ripping off the person who needs to make the sale. And that's why they don't do it in Naharda. And they call them B'nai Achli Nichsei Da'achrazah, so the people who would eat up the property of those who have to do an Achrazah. Next, the Gemara says, how do you make sure that you don't have spoilage of an orphan's property? So Rabbi Yosef says, in the name of Shmuel, Metaltan of Yisama that needs to be sold, you sell it right away, you don't wait to do Nachraza. So Rabbi Yosef says, you wait at least to the day of the market. You get a good price on the day of the market. The Gemara says, not a It depends if the market day is a long way off or not. If it's a long way off, you sell it right away. If it's not a long way off, then you wait till market day. Next, the Gemara says Rav, Chav, uh, Rav Kahana had beer which belonged to Rav Mashar Shibar Chilkoi, was a Yasam. And he wanted to sell it for him, but he waited until the Yom Tov. And he said, even though it began to taste off a little bit, still it would be better to wait and sell it then because he would be able to get cash on demand at the time of the Rega when people bring money with them. And there they'll be able to sell it. If ever we sell it now, I'll have to sell it on credit and it won't be good. The next case, the says Ravina Zuti. Uh, the one says Ravina had wine which belonged to Ravina Zuti, who was a Yasam, the son of his sister. And he had his own wine as well, and he wanted to travel with his wine to the city of Sikhra to sell it there. He also wanted to bring the Yasam's wine there. Oh, he was afraid, maybe I'm not allowed to take the Yasam's wine, because I'm taking the risk of the ship sinking. So who says I'm allowed to take a risk with the Yasam's wine? So he went to Ravashi. Ravashi said, no, you can take it with you, it's not any different than your own wine. If you're willing to take the risk for your own wine, you're allowed to take the risk for the Yasam's wine as well. Now we're in the next mission, which moves on to situations in which a woman may not get a ksuba because of various scenarios that affect the marriage. So we have a list here. The mission begins with a Mima Enes. Mima Enes is a woman who's only married to a man, Midira Bonon, and she can cancel the marriage at any time by just getting up and walking out. And she obviously doesn't get a ksuba because she is the one who's responsible for ending the marriage. The whole point of the ksuba is to give her security to stay in the marriage and the husband can't end it on her without certain responsibilities. If she's ending it, there's no reason she should get a ksuba. Now, it also rules that she does not get payrois and she doesn't get mezunis. So what's payrois? So Payroy, so as she explains, is the things that she gets in exchange for the fruits of her nechse malug. The husband gets the payroy of her nechse malug. In any marriage, she gets in exchange for that, he has to redeem her if she gets captured. So the rights of redemption, which is in exchange for payroy, she doesn't get that. And the third thing is Mizon, so she doesn't get support. Now as she's bothered by if she's Mima Enes, then she's not gonna she's not supposed to get support anymore. She's not even married to the guy. So as she says that means that if she if her husband went away for a while while they were married and she borrowed money in order to eat and she was expecting her husband to pay that back, but then she was Mima Enes, he no longer has to pay it back anymore. All right now we'll begin with the now we'll continue the list in the Mishnah of other women who may or may not get Ksuba, Peros, and Mizona. So a Shnia, that is a woman who's violating a Isser Durabanon in her marriage is one of the marriages which are rabbinically forbidden because of relationships, because of close relatives. So there, she loses her ksuba as well. Rashi explains that she's considered to be the one who convinces him to do this, because she has nothing to lose. She doesn't become a puzzle from this, and her children don't get a puzzle from this marriage, and therefore she doesn't lose anything, and therefore she's probably the one who talked him into it, and therefore she loses the ksuba for it. Third on the list is an islandist. She loses all these things as well, and that's because it was a Mekach Tois. Uh, he married her with the understanding that she was normal and healthy, and she turned out to be an islandist who is not. Now, also on the list of things that she doesn't receive, she doesn't get the blood, she doesn't get the worn out clothing that women usually get as part of the marriage. Now, situations in which you may think she doesn't get, but she does, that's an islandess where he knew she was an islandess and he married her anyway. She has the right to the ksuba. And now, Isirei Lav, an Amana marrying a Kohen Hagadol, a Gusha, a Chalutza marrying a Kohen Hedyet, Mamzeros, and Sinu is marrying Yisrael, or Bas Yisrael marrying a Sinu Mamzer. All of them do have a ksuba, and that's because the woman gets a in those situations, or her children get a 
and therefore the only reason she's marrying is because he must have talked her into it. Umarna goes into the concept of a marriage of a kitana who's married off by her mother or her brothers. It's not a marriage of Daraisa. Umarna goes into that altogether. And we have two cases to discuss. One is while she's married, and if she gets divorced with a get, that is, this marriage follows normal procedures, doesn't rely on any Darabon and Heterim. So is that considered to be a real marriage, or is it just an arrangement to meet Darabon and it's not an actual marriage? And if you say that that is a real marriage, then what about a Mima Enes? That's where she literally walks out and cancels the marriage. So then Lima Freya, retroactively, she made it like they were never married. So there, I would understand that that is not considered a real marriage at all because it was canceled. So Limar says, it's Rav and Shmuel. Rav and Shmuel both agree that a Mima Enes who cancels the marriage retroactively is like she was never married. And therefore, she doesn't have any halachos of being married. A number of halachos which don't apply, which we'll list soon. The machlokas is, if there was a regular marriage and it's not cancelled, that if she get divorced with a get, she had a real marriage, she got divorced with a get, is that considered married or not? So Rav says it's not considered married, and she doesn't get exuba even if she didn't do me. And Shmuel says, no, she does get exuba, she is considered married. Now, Amima Enes, they agree, is not considered married, and the Gemara now quotes... Shmuel is saying these halachas at length. So Shmuel says, Imam Enes does not get exuba, while a kitana who had a regular marriage and is divorced with a get, she does get exuba. Imam Enes does not, is not usher on the brothers of her husband because she was never really married to him in the first place. She just had a be without a marriage and that doesn't usher on his brothers. She also is not possible to kahuna if she, she's not considered to be divorced. While a kitana who gets a get, she is considered to be divorced. Rav would disagree with all these halachas of kitana being differently. Rav would say that even though she gets a get, it's the same. It's not considered a real marriage. A to beget, again, Shmuel says, is puzzle on the brothers. She's considered has been married to her husband. She's also puzzle on kahuna. Now, Amima Enes does not have to wait three months after she's married. Now, the halacha is that any woman who's married has to wait three months before she can remarry, so we make sure she's not pregnant. Now, in Katana, we know she's not pregnant. Katana can't be pregnant. However, we may have to make her wait anyway. Like, plug, Gzeira, out of all marriages are the same, but that would only apply to a real marriage. So, Mima Ennis is not a real marriage. We don't have to make her wait three months. However, a Yotsa Beget, she was married and she went through the regular marriage processes. She does have to wait three months. I think Mar asks all these halachas are repeated in Brisa. Why does have to say them? And says a Mima Enes, he is allowed to marry her relatives. She's allowed to marry his relatives. She's not possible to Kahuna. However, if she gives her a get, then they're each forbidden on each other's relatives and they are possible to Kahuna. So, what is the Chiddush? All these halachas are said. So, the Mar says the Chiddush is about waiting three months. That's not said. And that's what Shmuel is adding. The other ones are just thrown in agav.